Best of you adults and big kids can turn to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew chapter 18. Jesus has more things to communicate to us about his kingdom. Say his kingdom. Remember, as he taught us to pray, he, he told us to pray like this. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. We've also learned from previous uh, sermons that the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating or drinking or anything like that. But it's a matter of three things. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. And even though one day we will live in a beautiful kingdom prepared for us, right now we live in God's kingdom as believers in Jesus Christ because He's our King, we are His subjects, and He's given us principles to live by in His Word. Therefore, we live now in His kingdom. Are you happy about that? Amen. Let's read uh, what else He has to say. He gives another illustration. Jesus will either use a parable or a story, or He'll actually use tangible little examples as He does in this parable, or in this uh, portion of Scripture. Matthew chapter 18. Let's read uh, 10 verses together. Matthew chapter 18. It says, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and asked, here's the big question, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Because they realize now that, that Jesus had authority. He's doing these miracles. Uh, he's, he's, he's changing people's lives. They realize now that he was the sent one, that he was the Messiah. And, and they understood that there was going to be some kind of kingdom now beyond what they've experienced with the Romans. And, and Jesus was going to be the boss, say the boss. The boss. And, and being the boss, he needed some people with him. And so they were now arguing and debating who's the greatest in the kingdom. He called a little child and had him stand among them. Here's his illustration. And he said, I tell you the truth, unless you change, say change, change. and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself, therefore, whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes a little child like this in my name welcomes me, verse 6. But if anyone causes one of these little ones, and we just had a whole class of little ones, who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 7. Woe to the world because of things that cause people to sin. Such things must come, but woe to the man through whom they come. If your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands and two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. Verse 9. And if your eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the fire of hell. Is this a little too scary and too offensive today? If we don't look at scriptures like this, we are deceiving ourselves. We can't go through the Bible and just pick things that make us feel good. Uh, pick, pick things that give us the goosebumps and the and good feelings. All this is in Scripture. The Bible says that all Scripture is God-inspired. Every jot and tittle, every word. So, of course, he's not saying literally cut off your hand, literally cut off your foot, or literally, literally gouge out your eye. But you ever hear the term cut it out? I use that a lot at home, at home don't I? <laughs> uh, that's where it came from. Cut it out. Cut it off. If, if something is causing you to disobey God, cut it out of your life. Get rid of it. It's, it's called spiritual surgery, as it were. But what I'd like to do is, is look at um, these 10 verses 
verse 1 asks this awesome question. Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus brings that child to him and, and uses the child as the example. You know, this question is asked throughout the gospel. As a matter of fact, we're not going to go there, but for future reference for you, in, in Matthew chapter 20, just a couple of chapters ahead, the, the mother of, of James and John, they're called the son, sons of Zebedee, she comes up to Jesus and she asks, she asks Jesus, even after he said all this, she asked him, when you come into your kingdom, can my boys, say my boys, my boys. sit on your right and your left? You know, when you're, when you're in the kingdom. And Jesus said, basically, dear woman, you don't know what you're asking. Like, to me, I, I read that. And, and any time a, a mother speaks on behalf of, of, of her adult uh, sons, uh, there's something wrong anyway. But we won't go there, please. But suffice it to say, this place was reserved for people who humbled themselves. You see, the kingdom of God is all turned around. It's different than the world. In the world, if you want position, if you if you want to succeed, you have to be, you know, dog eat dog, you know. You have to do it to him before he does it to you. You have to you have to get up early and get out there, you know, while while everyone else is, is still asleep and, and you know you you gotta you gotta uh, have this kind of relationship with your boss. It would be called kissing up, but you know, let's not let's not go there either, you know. You know, you you have to you have to just be a man pleaser in order to succeed, right? Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't do things that, that please your boss and your company and so forth, but suffice it to say, there's a different system in the kingdom of God. He says things like, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. He says things like, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and he will lift you up. I remember the first time I was given any responsibility in, in ministry, it was to lead a home group. They called the mini churches. It was like a Bible study. And there were two of us, two what they called under shepherds in that group. And the guy that led the group was ready to turn it over to somebody. And uh, the guy beside me, beside me was, was older, much more knowledgeable in the word and so forth. So uh, in my heart, I just said, give it to him. He deserves it. And... Um, Lo and behold, the, the guy called us together and he said, you know, it's time for me to let go of the group and I've chosen one of you to, to take the group. And in my heart, I said, choose Jeff, choose Jeff, choose Jeff, choose him, choose him, choose him. And he said, George, it's you. <laughs> and, and everything that God's called me to do as, as a pastor, as a minister, it's been something that I have not strived for. It's been something that, that has been presented to me. And I like that because I know it's God and not me. Amen? Yeah, amen. You, know, you know, when God knocks on your door, when, when you're approached as opposed to, you know, making it happen, to me, I don't know, that, that kind of tells me that God's involved. Yeah, yeah. So, as I said, everything's turned around. Everything's different in the kingdom of God. There's no fighting for position and so forth. Now, he says some pretty hard stuff to people who... Uh, as he puts it, cause children to sin or abuse children and so forth. So we, and he says here that if you welcome a child, you welcome me, Jesus said. Loving and honoring children is like loving and honoring, write it down, Jesus. When we love children, when we put children first, when, when we do more than just tolerate them, but love them and, and